Mark, the 13th chapter, verse 9. Just want to read one verse for your consideration this morning. Mark, the 14th chapter, verse 9. Again, if you do not have a Bible, you would like uh, to read the word for yourself. Um, Bible is now been graciously provided during the center section. Just make sure you, you turn them after service is over. And then our youth are prepared to read as we get ready to hear the word of God. I'm so thankful for our youth, our young adults, our young adults, who are going to be taking care of our youth this morning. And I'm also so glad that our youth are going to be on the best behavior. Isn't that right? Amen. I'm so glad that our youth are going to be on the best behavior. Amen. Thank God for our youth department. Amen. And our youth are getting ready. They're gearing up and preparing for uh, their big day, which is going to be, I believe, it's the second week here in July. So, for those of you who have youth, please bring them out. Start bringing them out now uh, because our, our youth counselors are preparing them for their big day in July. So, please bring your youth out. Mark 14, chapter verse 9. And I have several uh, translations this morning, not just to have them, but I want to take a look at what the Word of God is saying according or uh, in reference to this individual. Mark 14, chapter, uh, verse 9, in the King James Version, it says, Verily I say to you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial for her. Uh, the, the GW version, the God's Word translation says, I guarantee this truth. Whatever the good news is spoken in the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So look what the Word of God is saying about this individual, about this woman. The Message Bible says this, and you can be sure that wherever in the whole world the message is preached, what she just did is going to be talked about admiringly. The Living Bible. And I tell you this in solemn truth, that wherever the gospel news is preached, wherever the news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and praised. Last of the voice translation. Believe me when I tell you this, tell you that this act of hers will be told in her honor as long as there are people who tell the good news. So as we look at these five different uh, translations of God's word from Mark 14, chapter verse 9, we see that these different uh, translations give a different insight about what this woman has done and because of what she did, is going to be spoken about her for a long time, as long as the gospel is preached. So I want us to see these different translations of what the Word of God has to say about this woman. And just for a short while, we're going to speak from this thought. How will you be remembered? How will you be remembered? And for a subtopic, I didn't put it on the, uh, on the screen, but for a subtopic today, we're going to be talking about Murder, money, and and the glories. Yeah, say that the last time. Murder, murder, money, and the glories. Murder, money, and the glories. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, about uh, how in the world? Uh, I can see we get the glories, but that's the text. But murder and money—that's nowhere in the text. Where, where are you going to get that from? Well, just bear with us, and we'll get there. So look at the lights, and we'll get there. We'll get there. As we uh, look at today's text, uh, we understand that this woman, whatever she did, is being talked about today. Now, we understand that the Bible was written a long time ago. And in this particular verse, it says that whenever the gospel is preached, wherever the word of God goes, what this woman did will be spoken of. So this is some 2,000 years later. And we are evidencing that the word of God is true, 
because we're still talking about what this woman did 2,000 years ago. And as we look over the house today, all of us have the understanding that this world is not our home. I mean, we all understand that this world is not our home. We come here to leave. As a matter of fact, uh, when we are born, we are closer to death than we really think. And I don't mean to be morbid, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, talking about uh, death, but we need to understand that this life, we are promised what, 80? The Bible says four score, which is four times 20, a score is 20, and four times 20 is 80. We're promised maybe 80, and some people don't even make it to 80 years, that's why I'm so grateful. Y'all may think I'm old because I'm 50, but I thank God that I made it to 50 because I know a lot of people who I grew up with who didn't make it to 50. So it's a blessing to be 25 twice. Amen. And when I think about that, you know, we all have to die. If Jesus does not come back first, we all have to die. And since we have to die, the thought in our mind is, what are people going to say about us when we're gone? What will people say about us when we're gone? Are they going to be glad that we're gone? Is it good riddance? Thank God they're no longer here. Really? Or will they have some nice things to say about us? Hence the title of today's sermon. How will you be remembered? And if we don't understand anything else about God, today's word, I want us to understand the big idea. The big idea says that if our desire is to hear God say, well done, later, after we die, then treasuring heavenly things must be our priority now as we live. So I'm going to make some now for you. I like to keep the dramatic statement short so you can remember. But this one is not, it's not too far from not too hard for you to remember. If we want to hear God say, well done, then what we do now will determine what happens later. And as I was thinking about, um, I was watching uh, one of the episodes of uh, Different World. Uh, that's one of the tablets that shows you done watching Different World. You always get caught up watching. But one of the episodes, uh, they had Gina, I can't remember, Tisha Campbell. She uh, was in the classroom, and the instruction from the teacher who was with the Goldberg told the whole class that they had to write their eulogy. And they had to deliver that eulogy in front of the class. And so many people got up, you know, some of the things they were saying were humorous, some things were funny, some things were serious. But when Tisha Campbell got up and she gave her eulogy, she basically said some things that um, made her seat come out of the closet. She had been suffering with AIDS and she was getting ready to die. And so her eulogy was kind of worth And as I was thinking about that, I wanted us to think, we're going to need to have to, if, if you have to plan your own eulogy, what would you say about yourself? Let alone what other people say about you. But do you have good things to say about yourself? Introspect. We need to first introspect. See what's inside of us. If we don't like what we see, how can we expect someone else to like what we see? What they see? God says that we need to start inside first, work on us, and if we don't like it, change it. If there's something you don't like about yourself, ask God for the Holy Spirit to give you the power to change what you don't like. Um, there may be some people in the house that are overweight. Don't look at me. But there may be some people who are overweight. If you don't like the way you look, then push, do some push aways Push away from the table. You know, stop being the elbow so much. If uh, somebody lives in the house and you don't like the way, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, some things we have the power to change with the help of the Holy Spirit. So God has said to change what you can change and allow you to do the rest. Many things that we do in this life are determined by where our treasure is. For where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. Where our treasures are, there will our heart be. So God is saying in this nomadic state of this big idea that if our desire 
is to hear you say well done. But we need to start now changing the things that uh, are not like him so that we can be in line with what he wants us to, to look like, to be like, to feel, to, to do, so that we can be in his image. We are to reflect the image of God. And if we're not reflecting God's image, then who's the image of God? Mm. If we're not reflecting God's image, and, and that's a discredit to him. Because when God created humanity, he made them in the image of himself. God made us in the image of himself. And he wants us to reflect his image. And if we are not reflecting his image, it's a sad indictment on the church. So when we go through life, are we going through life to try to please man? Are we going through life to try to please ourselves? Or are we going through life trying to do what's right and please God? Because only what we do for Christ is going to last. Only what we do is going to last. So if we want to hear God say, well are you done? Thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. Now enter to the joy of thy Lord. What we need to do to determine our future begins today. How will you be memorialized? And so, as you can tell, this is a, uh, a Memorial Day service. So, Happy Memorial Day! Because I'm going to Happy Memorial Day. Amen. Uh, it's good for us to understand why we celebrate some of the things we celebrate. So I did some research about Memorial Day. We think of why do we celebrate Memorial Day? Many of us already know. But you can't really think about this more information. Uh, the reason why we celebrate Memorial Day is it's a day that's been set aside to commemorate, to remember uh, military giants, military leaders, those in the military who have given the ultimate sacrifice so that we can have the freedoms we have. We celebrate Memorial Day because it's a time that we're supposed to, yeah, it's good that we barbecue, it's good that we have family and friends over, but really the day is to take a step back and remember how we got to where we are. We got here because of the the leaders, those in the army and the navy and the air force and the marines and um, all those special forces that gave their lives so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have today. So that we can enjoy the physical freedoms, the, the mental freedom, the, the social freedoms. And as we remember and think back, how dare we only remember uh, those who have given their lives for us who are now here on this side. But we also need to remember the ultimate sacrifice that was paid when Jesus Christ gave his life for us. Because what good would it do to have physical freedom, social freedom, uh, mental freedom, uh, freedom from your farm, and still go to hell and be buried while you're free physically and financially? God did so much through, uh, through Jesus when he died on the cross by his hands. When he gave his life for us, he died so that we could be free spiritually. He died so we could have spiritual freedom, and that's more than anything else. Uh, as we look at the Lord, they also, many of you may not know, that it, uh, traditionally it was on May the 30th. It was celebrated on May the 30th, but now it's been officially declared on the last Monday of May. Every year in May is the last Monday. How many of you knew that it was a fit that was traditional on the 30th? Anybody know that? Amen. We know something. Let's go forward. So as we as we look at our text, I just want to draw your attention to a few things that we'll move forward. How will you be uh, memorialized? Verse 1 of Mark 14, chapter. It says, Now the Passover and the festival, festival of eleven bread, were only two days away, and the chief priests <coughs> and teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. Now, when you uh, plan and plot someone's death ahead of time, what is that called? Premeditated murder. So if you're wondering how we would talk about murder, but here it is. And as we often say sometimes, you know, we think that the Bible is only talking about good stuff, and so we don't read the Bible that much. We like our soap operas and our... Um, um, uh, we're, we're kind of reality TV. We like our reality TV. But if you want to read some stuff that's got some dirt in it, some trash, 
some uh, murder, some scandal, uh, some adultery, some fornication. It's in the Word of God. We need to think about Bibles to begin to read this. There's some juicy hot topics in there. Amen. So we talk about murder. Uh, these people, the, the, the priests, the high priests, and uh, the teachers of the law, they are the ones who should have known Jesus the best because they studied the Word of God. They knew that Jesus was coming. And they were the very ones who wanted to murder him. Yeah. They were the very ones who wanted to kill him because he was taking over their territory. Yeah. There were more people shouting Jesus than they were shouting the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Bernadines and the Bernadines. They, they, there were more people who were shouting for Jesus than they were for the scribes and the teachers. And so they got offended. They got hurt in their feelings and we got to take this guy out. We got to take him out. Because he's, he's stealing our people, he's still like he's talking about our traditions, he's calling us vi vipers and snakes. We can't help him. He got to go. This joker got to be killed. We don't we don't kill him. We're gonna murder him. And so they begin to plot to murder him. Somebody say murder. Verse two. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining the table in the home of Simon Leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. So as uh, the, the, the chief priests and teachers were, were planning on and plotting and scheming to arrest Jesus and have him killed, they said that they wouldn't do it during the festival because the people may start a riot. And so while Jesus was in Bethany, he was at the, this person's house by the name of Peter. Peter the Simon the leper. And they were at a dinner. They were reclining at the table. So they don't eat like we eat. You know, back in the day, they, they didn't eat like we sit at the table and eat. But they lay down and reclined. There was a leather table where they would lay down and, 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 and have their feet stuck out. And they would recline at the table. And as Jesus was with his disciples were trying the table, this woman comes in unannounced, uh, boom, brash, comes in and breaks this alabaster box. Now this alabaster box, let's pick a number and talk about this alabaster box. It was a box that resembled uh, marble. And it was, uh, it was kind of expensive. The box itself had at least sentimental value to the woman. And if you read a different translation, you will read a different, uh, a different gospel, you understand this woman's name was Mary. She was Mary. And Mary broke this alabaster box, which contained some oil in it. Now, the alabaster box itself was, was uh, significant and sentimental to her. But the oil inside the box was even more precious. It was more expensive. This was nard. It was a, a precious oil. And what she did with that oil, if you read um, Mark's account, we'll see that she poured on his head. But if you read John's account, he says that she poured on his feet. So which one's correct? Both. Both are correct. She poured on both his head and his feet. And that's why, you know, people try to make the Bible, they try to say the Bible contradicts itself. No, the Bible does not contradict itself. It complements itself. So she poured it on both his head and his feet. And um, as we look at what she poured, this is good. I hope I can deliver this the way God gave it to me. So this alabaster box was precious to her. But the oil that was in the box was even more expensive. So what we're actually talking about is a container and its contents. Everybody say container and contents. And what God revealed to me is that sometimes we spend more time on our container than we do on our content. She broke her container. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. He wants us to come before Him broken. You know, sometimes we come before God too holy and too high and too lifted up. And God can't do anything with us because anything that's prideful has no way to go but down. But God's word says that when we come to you, we can come boldly, but come in a humble manner. 
And when we come broken and contract for the Lord, He says that I will lift you up. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to break our containers. He wants us to break our containers and pour out to Him what He's placed inside of us. And what God has placed inside of each of us, God wants to, us to give birth to what He has placed inside of us. Because when we give birth to what God has placed inside of us, it's going to bless Him, it's going to bless the body of Christ, and it's going to bless the individual who gives birth to it. Look at somebody say, I'm pregnant. Now look at somebody else and tell them, I will give birth to whatever God placed in me. Amen. Amen. And you got to be careful when you somebody tell you pregnant. Amen. Amen. God has put something special in each of us, as we said earlier. God's placed something special in us. And He wants a, a return on His investment. He wants a return on His investment. If, if I give you and Greg some money, uh, well, not, not, this is a bad example. When you go to the bank, the area, when you go to the bank and you borrow some money, what's the bank you're looking for? They want some interest. God has deposited His Spirit in us. He wants some interest. So what are we doing with the Spirit God gave us? What are we doing with whatever God has equipped us with? Do we even know what God has equipped us with? Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So she broke the jar. And she poured perfume on his head and on his feet. Verse 4. Some of the, those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages, and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Somebody say money. This is what we talk about, that thing that all of us uh, have in our pockets, or wish we had in our pockets, talking about some money. So, just to recap the story, they're having dinner, they were trying to the table, this woman comes in, breaks her out of the box, begins to pour oil on Jesus' head and his feet, and then the disciples just begin to say, this is a waste. Look at this. Look at this woman. Come in here, I'm going She didn't ask if she come in here. Come in here, it's putting this, this uh, expensive perfume on Jesus' head and feet. Uh-uh. This money, the uh, this stuff should have been sold and given to the poor. It should have been given to the poor. Money. They were more concerned about money than what the woman was doing. Amen. And we'll leave that just a minute. But as we talk about money, uh, many of us think that money is the root of all evil. And it is not. Uh, money is not the root of all evil. As a matter of fact, as I was thinking about money, money is an inanimate object that you can use to transfer and barter services and stuff. Money is not evil in itself. The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. The things we want to do for some money. Now, I have to say that one of my things is I've been saved. I would not have done some strange things for some money. I might go, oh, look, I ain't going to take what I did. You don't even know what I did. But I've done some strange things for money. And I'm sure that you like me, you've done some strange things for money. And God says, uh, if you get your priorities right, then I can bless you. And so it brings up the point of why do we give to God? Why does God ask us for our money? Uh, the book of Malachi 3.8, it says, Bring your tithes to the storehouse, that there may be need of supplies and provision in God's house. And God says, test me in this. See, if I tell you to try it, if you bring your money to me, see my own the windows of heaven, and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. So why does God ask us for our money? Does God need our money? Come on. You mean the one who created the heavens and the earth. He needs our money. The one who flung the stars in the sky. Who needs? No, God does not need our money. As a matter of fact, uh, Psalms 24 says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. For he has found it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. God doesn't need 
need my money. And so now he owns uh, the cattle on a thousand hills. And he owns the hills that those cattle are on. God does not need our money. So then why does he ask for it? He asks for it so that we can be blessed. Because if there's one thing that humanity loves more than anything else, it's our money. And if we can give God a portion of our money, then that tells him that he can have a portion of everything else of us. But if we can't give God our money, we're definitely not going to give him our hearts. We definitely not give him our time, our souls. Our, if we can't part with money, then we're definitely not going to give him anything else. So God says, if we can part with your money, then I know you trust me. And as a matter of fact, this is another topic. When we give God a tenth of our earnings, God says, I'm going to bless you so much so that you won't even miss that 10%. The 90 or less that you have, I'm going to bless that so much that you won't even miss the 10%. But many of us are conditioned that we have to get ours first. Because we are, the world has trained us, uh, me, myself, and I. You know, I come first, and if I don't come first, then we come first. And if we don't come first, then I, then I come first. The world says, get what you can, can it all you get, and then sit on the can. Don't let nobody else have nothing, you get what you can get, and forget about everybody else. But God says, it's different, give, and it shall be given unto you. Well, the world's like, I don't understand that. We don't have to understand it. God's mathematics is so not like our mathematics. God has a way of multiplying stuff that we can't even conceive. God says, when you give to me, I'll give it back to you. But not just the way you gave it. I'll give it back good measure, press down, shake it, and you thought that was a devil you to run it over. When we give to God, He blesses us in abundance. Not just the money, health. How many people would give up all the money they had their children were saved? How many people would give up all the money they had they had good health? Amen. Amen. That talks about money. It could have been sold for more than a year's wages. When I studied that, a year's wages back in that time. So they're talking about 300 denarii or 300 pence. And back 2,000 years ago, that was worth like today $104. So you can make $104 to us. Anybody think $104 is a lot of money? If you don't think so, then give me $104. Because I can do something with it. But a lot of people think $104 is not enough. Uh, it's not enough. But if you, if you go back 2,000 years, $104 is a lot of money. So that was like a year's wages. So that's how much this perfume costs. Verse 6. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you have always with you, and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. So, what Mary did, and I don't even know if the scriptures do it justice because the scriptures wouldn't really don't say that she knew what she was doing, but she did it anyway. She, uh, it doesn't really say that she knew she was anointing him for his burial. For the Bible scholars, we know that when Jesus uh, gave up his body when uh, you know the story that Jesus was uh, sent from God to earth to be our Savior. And he died on the cross for our sins. And when he died, after he was dead, uh, you know, the Roman soldiers stuck the spike in his side and blood and water came streaming out just to make sure he was dead. And they were getting ready to break his legs, but they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. But when they took Jesus down from the cross, there was a sack. And the Sabbath back then was a Saturday. And the Jews believed they could do no work on Saturday. So usually, when they would take the body down from the cross, they would anoint it. They would anoint the body with oil and wrap it in linens and all spices and all that kind of stuff. But they didn't have time because the Sabbath, the dark was coming. So they just wrapped it in linen and put it in the grave, in the, in the arcade. And so what this woman, what this woman did, what this, what this woman did, but well, she was anointing him before his death because there wouldn't have been time to anoint him. And what I love about God is that even though this woman didn't particularly know what she was doing, 